mom and holistic health seeker who, after suffering an injury that wouldn't heal, was led on a journey to seek out alternative, holistic, and natural medicine. She now shares what she learned, helping people and their cats along their path to holistic health. Pam has taken courses in holistic health for animals, muscle testing, and animal communication. Please welcome Pam. Back to News for the Soul. Happy Monday, everybody. Welcome back to the Perfectly Holistic Radio Show. It is so great to be back with you today. And we are so honored to have Dr. Katie Woodley join us again and share her amazing knowledge and expertise. And for those of you who don't know her, I just want to give you just a brief background on her. Uh, she is the proud owner and holistic veterinarian of the Natural Pet Doctor. After watching her own husband develop an autoimmune disease and be told that there was nothing they could do other than strong immunosuppressive medications, Dr. Katie went down the path of holistic medicine. She started the natural pet doctor after being in the conventional vet world for over 10 years to provide pet parents with more resources for natural medicine advice and care so that they had all of the options. Her mission is to ensure that all pet parents have access to herbal medicine, supplementation, and nutritional advice through their pet's lifetime that helps them thrive rather than just survive. Dr. Katie also offers telehealth consultations to pet parents across the world and provides health consultations in the Northern Colorado region, along with online education through her courses, membership, YouTube channel, Facebook, and Instagram, and you can find out more about Dr. Katie at thenaturalpetdoctor.com. So Dr. Katie, welcome back. It's so great to have you here. Yes, thanks for having me again, Pam. I'm really excited, especially about this topic we're going to cover today. This is a really <laughs> interesting topic. I would just ask that everybody come with an open mind and put aside any you know, preconceived ideas that you may have, uh, especially you, know, you have to understand that we are taking a look at things from an alternative viewpoint and not necessarily what the conventional veterinary world has been taught. So that's why I love taking deep dives like this so we can just kind of pull the, the layers back and take a peek at what's really going on with the world of prescription diets. So take yes. it away. <laughs> awesome. So <laughs> yes, and I here's the thing. I used to prescribe these diets to my patients. You know, it's it's what we were taught in veterinary school. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes cats seem to do pretty well with some of these diets where they are having GI upset or skin issues and we change their diets to these prescription foods, you may see an improvement. So that is something like it's not like this will always cause adverse reactions and problems. Now, I have other theories for why those pets improve when we do change the diet and we change the types of food. Um, and it comes back down to how pet foods are made, but also what do our cats thrive on and what are they supposed to be eating? And when we look at diets, we always go back to the basics because we have to. And our cats are obligate carnivores. They require higher amounts of protein in order for them to thrive. They need they actually have zero requirements for carbohydrates. So they can get all of their caloric requirements, their energy from protein and fat. And so mm -hmm. they're very different than, than us, right? They're very different from okay. dogs. Dogs also have no physiological requirement, but they can tolerate a little bit more carbohydrates. They have a little bit more digestive enzymes than our cats. And what has happened over time is you know, back in the early 1900s, when pet food started to become made and processed, mm -hmm. that's when we saw the change over to our cats being fed kibble diets, being fed processed food diets. So even like canned foods. And here's the thing, a lot of pet parents don't realize is that that processing started with because of money. It wasn't because we needed to optimize overall pet health. Pet food was actually made by like a I think it was like an electrical engineer watching salesmen, sales, uh, sailors come into dock and they were feeding like their old, like dried up biscuits to dogs. And he's like, huh, 
I can make money off of this. And so he took that idea. And this is where we saw Perina Biscuit. Um, they formed and the, they were the start of like the milk bones and we've got oh, pet yeah. food. So like the entire history of pet food, a lot of veterinarians don't even realize how and why it started. And it didn't start because the health of our pets was at the forefront of everything. No. And so when, you know, when we look at our cats and what do they need, what we've gotten so far away from, especially if our cats are being fed a processed food diet, they're on kibble. Kibble's really high carbohydrate, very low moisture. Is that the ideal diet for a cat? No, because no. cats actually, they came from desert animals. They had they have very little drive to drink water. They got most of their water from the prey. They eat, you know, mice. They eat, uh, they're going to eat your small mammals. They're going to eat birds. They're going to eat insects. And that prey composition is typically around 50 to 60% 60, 60 water. And then also it's 50% protein, it tends to be around 30% fat. And then there can be a little bit of carbohydrates. That's going to be what's leftover in the stomach contents that it's already pre-digested, broken down. And our cats will eat that when they're eating an actual like live prey. So that is what our cats are made to eat. And so when we look at that, we have to go back to like, what do they do well with? They have not evolved significantly from that with their digestive tracts. And so that's why they can do so well with high, high quality protein diets, raw food diets, and our prescription diets, unfortunately, it's another way for, <laughs> it's another money maker, right? Like, unfortunately, when right. we start looking at the ingredients, those ingredients aren't very different from a lot of the normal foods that are out on the market that you can pick off the shelf. Like if you walk into, you know, Petco or your big pet food brands. Mm -hmm. And so that's, when I started looking at the labels and comparing it, I was like, what is happening? Why are we doing this? And this doesn't make sense. So there's there's a huge issue surrounding these. They're super expensive. I mean, just looking at some of the, the brands that are out there for like skin issues, limited ingredient diets. I mean, eight and a half pound bag and it's $65. Like, whoa, that's insane. Yeah. And there's nothing in it. Like there's no, no nutrition in it. Like, And there's no medication in it. There's yes. nothing medication about it. Yes. And that is a huge issue. And I, I believe there are actually some lawsuits floating around right now because mm -hmm. technically we can't prescribe food. Food is not, even though we say food is medicine all the time, technically right. it's not, we can't write a prescription. Right. And so this is another marketing scheme essentially where, you know, as veterinarians, we're taught like this is an ideal food. There's all sorts of studies and research behind it. Unfortunately, it's not well regulated by the FDA. Also, right. there are no long term studies. So this goes for pet food in general. We tend to hear, you know, it's AFCO approved. It went through like food trials. Those trials are six pets for six months. So if you have a cat that's eating a kidney disease, a kidney prescription diet, it's very low protein. Great. Those six cats like didn't die during the six months they were on it. But what happened after? Did they start losing muscle mass? Did they start becoming nutritional deficient. Like, how do we know if we're not actually doing the studies and how can we actually say as veterinarians that this is the most ideal diet for these animals? And that's a huge problem. When you make a good point, it, their trials are not designed to see if the pets would thrive. It's just, will they survive? Yes. Is it the minimal amount of nutrition to keep them alive? Yep. Basically versus be vibrantly healthy and thrive. Yep. And that's a big difference. <laughs> it is. And if a pet or if, so if an animal fails the trial, so say something happens, they get too sick or right. we see like kidney values spike or, you know, they I think they test like five different levels and that's it for the blood work. Wow. If something happens, they can actually remove that animal and just replace them. And so it's, there it's obscene like it doesn't it's not a very good clinical trial right we right. would expect that these animals would be in this trial being followed we're actually measuring like gut health what's going on with microbiome we know microbiome is so key to optimal health none of that's being measured we're not looking at the level of inflammation in the body we're not looking at you know we do a lot of hair tissue mineral analysis tests what is their nutritional content of the body of the hair are there heavy metals like there's none of that being looked at and six months is nothing. 
Yeah. You know, our cats can live to be 30 and that's always the goal. So for six months of their life, how are we supposed to see that this diet is not creating a nutritional deficiency for them? Exactly. Exactly. And like you said, it, a six month window is really just a snapshot in time. And, and for a lot of cases, you as a veterinarian know this to be true. Sometimes it takes a couple years or more for a disease process to really show up, yes. but it started months, if not years prior. So yes. you see the long-term effects, not the, not necessarily, there's not the immediate negative side effects to these things. Yeah. And that's the thing. And this is the hard part when you try to have a conversation about this, right? It's a very controversial mm -hmm. topic. It's very heated talking about food. And I get this too, when I talk to colleagues is that, um, you know, how do you know what causes disease, right? They're not dying. My pet's feeling great. There's no outward health issues. Here's the thing. I always talk about how we are on a spectrum of health, right? Where hopefully down here, zero symptoms, optimal health. Up here is going to be, you know, cancer, autoimmune disease, death, essentially, right? We want to be down here. And mm -hmm. we're constantly fluctuating on this spectrum. And just because you don't have a symptom or your pet doesn't have a symptom doesn't mean that there's no inflammation occurring in the body. Inflammation is occurring all the time. Acute inflammation is important. So like you cut yourself, you were hoping that we get inflammation in that area, right? It gets a little bit red, irritated. It brings like white blood cells to the area to help heal it, make sure there's, you know, cleans up the bacteria. And then what should happen is the body goes back to a normal state. So yeah. it shouldn't set up, you know, where we get this like low grade grass fire in the body. That's this chronic inflammatory process. And now everything's going haywire, but it may not have met the threshold where you see symptoms. So this is the problem and this, the foods that we're seeing and the quality of the ingredients that are being used in these diets are creating inflammation in our pets' bodies. And thank goodness now there's a lot more research out there that you can actually bring to your veterinarian and have a discussion or just kind of say like, hey, look, there is, there is science behind why these foods are not optimal for our pets or why fresh food, less processed diets are going to be better. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. And Whenever I hear that, I go back to my husband and his autoimmune disease. Like we live a healthy lifestyle. And what happened is, is like something was going on. We had no idea. Right. And then right. he got to a point where his body broke, his immune system broke. He developed an autoimmune disease. And when that system breaks, it's a lot harder to get it back into homeostasis, back into balance. And this mm -hmm. is exactly what's happening to our pets. So we're feeding these poor quality ingredients. We don't even realize it. We don't see GI symptoms. So we think that it's fine. Their stool is normal. Our cats are feeling great. But then we do a vaccination, right? Or mm -hmm. we do a flea and tick preventative, or there's a lot of stress in the house. And what it's doing is it's inching your cat higher and higher to that threshold. And once you cross it, that's when we see disease. So this is why food is always the foundation. It's something that's going into them every single day. It is a huge pillar of health. And that's why when I see pets going on prescription diet, the first thing I do, especially with cats, like urinary disease, kidney disease, my goal is always how can we get them off of these diets because of the poor quality ingredients being used. Totally agree. hundred percent. Like Laura Lee says the, the, the trials are very biased. Yes. A lot of times. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, who's running them? The pet food company that's making the food, right? They want it yeah. to succeed. They are the like, more, like, more results they want to see at the end of the trial. So they, yeah. kind of, they manipulate to get those results. Like you said, yes. they can pull up, they can withdraw an animal that got sick from it and just put somebody else in there. That yep. that doesn't that's not really an honest look at your your panel of candidates, you know, your no. your, your uh, pets that are in that trial because it wasn't the same as when it's not the same group that they started with when they finished. It's totally so it's skewed you know, to do. Exactly. And here's the thing. So I, it's funny because I knew we were having this discussion. We talked about nutrition too, with like the holistic cat conference this past weekend too. Mm -hmm. And I got, I get the journal of veterinary medicine that comes, you know, comes, I think twice a month and mm -hmm. I always take a look at it. It's conventional. Right. And they had an article on cat nutrition. I was like, huh, that's huh. interesting. And it was talking about how 
we can feed carbohydrates. And I was like, what is going on? And I was like, no, no. no." And it was like, but carbs can turn into, you know, glucose too. And yeah, they don't have it, you know, they don't have a lot of amylase, but their pancreas makes digestive enzymes. And I was like, this is why we're seeing so much pancreatitis. This is why we see so much like GI disease. This is why our cats are obese. Like, it's just like, diabetes, like all these diseases come back to like us saying that, no, we can put more carbs in the food. And I'm like, the, and I looked at who wrote the article, right? I went yeah. to the very end and I said, who's funding this? Yes. This big pet food company, pet right? Food company. And, you know, it's one of those things where, yes, we can use these foods, but is it the best diet for our cats? No, it's not. Yeah. Why do they use it? It's cheaper. So yes, corn, can be digested. It has a higher protein content, but is corn ideal for a cat? I've never seen a cat like out in the wild going and chewing on like a corn cob. Like if you've seen that, send it to me. Like, I'd love to see a picture of it, like a cat self-selecting corn. And, you know, maybe sometimes they eat certain things, but this is the problem. And this is what we're finding with these, these, especially prescription food diets. Yes. So let's talk about some of those ingredients that you dug into on the back of these bags because it's it's incredible. It's totally an eye opener. So you guys hold your hats, get ready. Hope to yeah. <laughs> let us <sit> down. <laughs> you better sit down. Yes. <laughs> It, it is. It's one of those things. I don't use them at all anymore. I stay away from them. But a lot of my patients come to me needing help because they're still having health issues, which, of course, I'm not surprised by when they're mm-hmm. on these diets. And I go back through the ingredients and I'm just like, what is this? And so let's go through. So I'm not going to name brands. We all kind of know the big brands that are out there. So I'll just refer to them in categories. So one of the ones that always... It, it's like the worst one out there, I feel like, are the foods for limited ingredient diet or like diet trials. So if your cat has itchy skin, you're worried about allergies, sensitivities, maybe they're getting like ear infections, or even if you're looking at doing like a food trial because they have GI disease, this is when these diets are typically prescribed to you from your conventional vet. So one of the really, really common ones. So when we talk about looking at these, like the ingredients, we're talking about the ingredient list. And this is really important for every single cat parent to learn how to read these ingredient lists or become familiar what it means. So keep in mind, they're all listed by weight and it's going to be water weight. So for your dry foods, if you see like chicken, chicken's going to be before it was processed at a high heat temperature. So it's going to have 90% water. So it's going to look like it's the most concentrated. It's ingredient number one. But once that water is removed, it moves really far down the list. Mm -hmm. So this is another marketing tactic to be aware of because they know you want to see like meat at at the beginning of the ingredient list. So with this, with this, the, the allergy food, limited ingredient prescription diet, So this is going to be, there's brewer's rice is the first ingredient. Then we have hydrolyzed chicken liver. So it's broken down into small enough particles that the body's not supposed to react to it. Then the next, the next ingredient is going to be rice protein concentrate. Then we have powdered cellulose. So this is like sawdust, soybean Uh oil, which is a GMO product heavily sprayed by glyphosate. So that's Roundup. That is a known antibiotic chemical that kills the microbiome. Yep. And then we have coconut oil, chicken liver flavor, and then we have vitamins, synthetic vitamins and minerals, because obviously there is nothing in here. And so when I see that, like my blood boils, because I'm like, these animals could already be nutri- like nutrient deficient, which is why they're itching. They might not have enough omega-3s. The microbiome might be off. And now we're feeding a really high carbohydrate diet. This was a dry food brand. And it has no moisture in it. And our cats need high moisture in their diets. Um, And so I look at this and it just, it makes me so sad. And this is the eight pound bag for $65. Like, and most like, here's the other thing too. There have been numerous studies that have shown that over 40% of these prescription foods had ingredients that weren't even listed on the ingredient list. So if you're trying to do a limited ingredient food trial, so those can be like six to eight weeks. If you're feeding this food and you're trying to avoid say beef, there could be beef in this, you know, your cat reacts to it. So that's the problem with these. We, we have no control over it, poor quality ingredients. Um, and it's, there's, there's no, there's no muscle meat in it. 
No. There's, there's zero. There's zero muscle meat. There's hydrolyzed chicken liver that's been, you know, broken down so small. At least there's some chicken liver, I guess, if there's going to be a silver lining. But that that food just always, always blows my mind when we look at those ingredient lists. Right. Totally agree with you. And then the the, uh, the food, what was it? Um, natural flavors. That's just, oh. in most of the time, that's just chemicals to make it taste good. It is because this stuff tastes like cardboard. So yeah. especially I know Madison's here and her kitty with like stage one kidney disease. So your vet sees a little bit of an elevated creatinine and BUN. And the mm -hmm. first thing they say is you have to go on kidney diet. Here's the thing. So some of the, the kidney diets, I looked at canned food because if you're feeding a kibble kidney food, you need to get them at least over to a canned diet. They need moisture. Ideally get yeah. them onto a better quality food. But other than like, if you could do just one thing, get them off kibble, get them onto a canned food. Now, the thing with the, the canned food diets, they're supposed to be higher in protein than kibble. They usually, they tend to be higher um, compared to kibble. And I went through some of these common kidney diets, these prescription foods, and these canned foods were 5% protein. When I actually worked out how wow. much, uh, like a dry matter basis, these canned foods, 5%. Our cats typically are self-selecting their ideal prey, right? Ratio yeah. is 50% protein. Yeah. So what happens over time? And we see this, I see it in my patients. If they come to me and they've been on these kidney diets, they start using their own muscle Yep. Because it's got to come from somewhere. They need they they have a high requirement for protein. So if it's not coming from the food, then what's going to happen is, is we see these cats that are muscle wasted. Their yep. spines are protruding. They're very bony. They don't feel good. And of course, when that happens, now the kidneys are under more stress because it has to process that through the kidneys. So these diets are not helping our cats. And there should not be any recommendation. There's no research to show that these cats should be going on these kidneys kidney disease diets until end stage potentially. And even then, I it's like I would be looking at keeping these cats eating, making sure they're staying hydrated, using supplements that are supporting reducing inflammation, using herbal medicines that's help increase blood flow to the kidneys. Yeah. I that is like the last thing I look at. And it 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 once again just blows my mind. And I didn't put the pricing. I can't it's it'll be about the same, I imagine. It's higher priced. I look at, so for, for one of the brands, they have chicken byproducts. They have chicken, chicken liver, corn flour, brewer's rice flour, pork plasma, fish oil, powdered cellulose, natural flavors. Um, and then it goes into the, the vitamins and minerals, mm -hmm. synthetic vitamins and minerals, because, so here's the thing too, with byproducts, the byproducts get a bad name and byproducts are actually the things that we use to balance like homemade diets or the, the organ meats. So they can actually be, they're very nutritious when they're high quality. A lot of times though, these, that what these byproducts are, are going to be like the hoofs or the beaks or the chicken feet. So very low quality mm -hmm. uh, byproducts, not the high quality, healthy, the organs that you think of. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's something to be aware of too. Um, when you are looking at these ingredient lists, I would rather see byproducts than like corn flour, wheat, gluten, hundred percent. I'd rather see an entire diet made from byproducts than seeing that in, in the ingredient list. Absolutely. And then Madison has a question. She says, can kidney kitties have organ meat? Yeah, you can use organ meat 100%. So you have to be careful of like, so the biggest thing with your cats, especially if they're later stage kidney disease is you have to be careful of phosphorus content. Yeah. So that's where like going through, there's there's also great resources on catinfo.org for um, if you're looking at different brands and you're looking at phosphorus content. Um, but keep in mind too, like when we're looking at these foods, uh, your phosphorus content is going to be really high with the fish, if fish is in that ingredient list. So if you're using an over the counter food and there's fish in there, that's going to include bone, which is going to raise the phosphorus content and it's going to affect them. 
but you can definitely like supplement a little bit with uh, your organs. I love feeding kidneys to kidney cats. So mm -hmm. using the principles of organotherapy, and it's not something that you have to do all the time, especially if you're not using the organ meats as the vitamins and minerals. So if you're not like making a homemade diet and you're not relying on those to provide the vitamins and minerals, but it definitely can be a nice little treat for your, your cats that are, you know, their kidneys are working a little bit harder. Right. And it reminds me that there's still this, this myth out there that vets believe that kidney cats should be on a low protein diet. I know there's it's no studies that show it. Her to what biologically you just described them, their needs are, they need protein. Yep. So the first thing that these vets do a lot of times is they say you need to feed a low protein diet. And that, that makes absolutely no sense to me. Yep. And we're creating muscle, like we're, we're creating a muscle wasting and further issues yeah. down the road. And these poor cats, like, but, you know, kidney disease is not a death sentence. No. And, and that's the thing. Like we can get these cats by through and feeling really, really good for years and years by using fresh food diets and feeding them as close as possible to what their bodies were made for. And it's, it just breaks my heart where, you know, I see cats all the time that were on a raw food diet and. The other thing too, to be aware of for every cat parent here, there is a different reference range of BUN and creatinine that you need to be aware of for cats that are on a raw food diet. They yeah. will have slightly higher values that are completely normal still. But if your veterinarian reads it and doesn't understand that it changes because you're feeding a high protein diet, they'll say your cat has kidney disease when they right. don't. So that's another thing to be aware of. That's a great point because that yeah. How many, how many vets just don't know? Yeah. They did. We're not taught it. You know, I mean, it's for a lot of pet parents that come to me and that come to you, I'm sure, you know, with the stage one kidney disease, they're freaking out. Yep. They're freaking out because their vet has already put the fear of God that your cat's going to die. He's got stage yeah. one kidney. And I'm like, stage one. I'm like, we reverse that all the time. I'm not yeah. even like, I'm like stage one. I love state. Well, I That's don't know nothing. Have kidney disease, but well, there's so like, much. I, I love yeah. treating it because yeah. we can reverse it so easily and we get normal values. So many of my cat patients, yeah. like they go back to their vet and they're like, oh, just keep doing what you're doing. Obviously it's working. I'm like, do you want to know what I'm doing? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, this is how you treat it. Like this is, and they're on a raw food diet. Yeah. Like they went from a kidney diet to a raw food diet and their values reverse back to normal. Like that's the thing. Like when we support the body, when we give the body what it needs, mm -hmm. that's when we achieve optimal health. And it's like us dogs, cats, yeah. any living being that principle applies. And we tend yeah. to forget that. And it's, you know, I think one of the things that happens with the conventional vet side is that the tools are limited. And this is why I went into holistic medicine, because I was telling too many pet parents that there's nothing more we can do. And I was like, there's got to be more than we can do. Like, this makes yeah. zero sense. Like the immune system, the body, like it is amazing at what it can do to heal. You know, yeah. the energy, like what Pam, you do. Like, it's incredible when you tap into that. And we can reverse diseases that aren't supposed to be reversible. And, you know, conventional vets, they're just using the tools that they have, which are very limited. And so Absolutely. it's they just don't know what else to try or to do. Um, so Absolutely. that's why whenever you hear something that you don't agree with or it just doesn't sit right with you, I always tell people, like, keep asking, keep looking, like, put the question out there. There's so many amazing communities now where you can ask people, like, my gosh, my cat has stage one kidney disease. Like, where did you turn to? What are some of your resources? Who are you working with? And there's so many different modalities that we can use. Like I use some, other people use different ones. And like, it's what resonates with you, what works for your pet. Like, and that's what I love about the whole, the entire holistic realm of medicine is that you have so many options and you regain hope again. Exactly. And Nicole has one quick question and then we can move on to... Uh another one of your categories is what should the BUN value be or creatinine if they are on a, let's say if they're eating, how much higher should the, could those values be if they're eating a raw diet? You know, there's, I don't know if the, I can't remember off the top of my head, but what I can do, I'll share Pam with you. There's a great resource. It's actually dogs naturally has a resource. Okay. And I think Dr. Judy Morgan might have a resource too. Cause she just did an entire kidney week. So she's another yeah. great resource. 
but yes. it tends to be just a little bit higher. Like just it's a not little. a huge range, but what happens is like stage one tends to be above like 1.4 is when we start identifying stage one for creatinine. And so I think it's like 1.6 um, mm -hmm. is still within a normal range. Uh, so it just elevates it a little bit. So that's yeah. where if you're like getting a diagnosis of stage one and you're feeding a raw food diet, I'd be going back and saying like, wait a second. And that's where you can look at like SDMA, which is more specific for identifying yeah you know, the kidney filtration um, and seeing like, is that slightly elevated? What's the urine concentration to keeping in mind, like a raw food diet is a lot higher in water content. So that will mm -hmm. also dilute urine a little bit more versus if you were feeding kibble, you're going to tend to see a really high, highly concentrated urine. But when we look at all of those factors, those are all the things that your vet should be testing for to get a bigger picture of what the kidneys are doing. I would never say like just going off of BUN and creatinine by itself, unless it's like sky high, but then you need to look at, is there a UTI? Is there an yeah. infection somewhere? Is there, why is there inflammation in the kidneys? And it just, those better questions lead you down a better path of figuring out what it is. Exactly. So let's talk about another category that you okay. looked into for prescription and like one of my favorites, did you, did you pull up anything on urinary diets? Oh yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. So, so I mean, so many Let's cat parents, right? Like struvite crystals is a common yeah. one that cats are being diagnosed with, um, you know, stress cystitis, um, mm -hmm. where, you know, hopefully if you ever have a cat that has a urinary issue, make sure your veterinarian is running a urinalysis and they're not just putting them on an antibiotic and assuming that there's an infection. That's really, really important. The yeah. other thing to be aware of too, is that struvite crystals. So they tend to form in more alkaline, uh, urine. And so mm -hmm. if your cat's on a kibble diet, it's going to cause the pH of the urine to be higher and more likely for struvite crystals to form. But the other thing is too, is that if we allow the urine to sit there, like we collect it and it just sits there, struvite crystals will naturally form. So it doesn't mm -hmm. mean your cat has it. So this is where I always look at, well, what was the pH of the urine? Because that's going to give us a better idea. If you're at like pH nine, then you see struvite crystals will be more than likely to say, okay, yes, that's probably a true like struvite crystal. Also mm -hmm. making sure there's no infection. Certain types of bacteria will cause the pH of the urine to be higher. Um, mm. So those are all important factors when we're looking at this. Now, if you have a cat that's constantly peeing outside the litter box and your vet's like, well, you're time to go on the urinary formula, right? You know, that's a common thing. And yeah. My question is, for one, why is the cat doing that? Like, better question, right? What's going on in yeah. the environment? What's the stress levels? What are we feeding? Because the biggest thing, too, is that for any cat, especially with urinary issues, kidney issues, if they are on a kibble diet, that you're, they're not producing enough urine to flush out the urinary tract and keep it healthy. So they need to go on to a high water content diet, canned food, or raw food diets or freeze dried with water added in. And a lot of times that alone will take the problem away. So when I look at these prescription diets, I went to the canned one because I was like, let's just like try to, you know, hopefully the vet's recommending at least the canned prescription diet. And so when I look at this, I see, so we have water <laughs> as the first ingredient, which makes sense. And then we have pork liver, we have chicken, we have carrots, wheat, gluten, rice, cornstarch, spinach, chicken liver flavor, chicken fat. Mm. And then I don't think this one included carrageenan. A lot of them will also have carrageenan added in. There's actually, um, I found it hiding in a GI prescription diet, which blew my oh, mind because yes. carrageenan is a thickener for canned foods and it yep. causes a lot of inflammation in the gut. So if you have a cat that's chronically like vomiting or diarrhea, loose stool, and you're not getting on top of it, and you're like, I'm feeding a prescription diet. Once again, you've got to look at the ingredient list and see, mm -hmm. is there carrageenan hidden somewhere in there? And you've got to sometimes like, there's a lot of ingredients here. Like, I mean, these are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, 10 levels, like down on my word document, like wow. there, because of all the synthetic vitamins and minerals that have to be added in because once again, poor quality ingredients, you know, it's, if you didn't add those, the cat would die. So that's how poor quality and unbalanced this would be if we didn't add that in. So I look at that and I'm like, how is, how is that any different than like just feeding like friskies or another over the counter food? 
Like it's, there's no, there's nothing special about it. Oh, the one thing they did add, I think, let me see if it's even in this one. A lot of times they'll add in acidifiers into these urinary diets. So your DL methionine is one that a lot of times you'll see for your urinary foods. Um, but I actually don't see it in there for that one. So that's interesting. But see, yeah. I'd be looking at, so if I, if you were my patient coming to me and your cat and they have a urinary issue, there's stress, I'd be for one, looking at feeding an optimal diet. We know gut health is directly connected to the brain through the vagus nerve. And if that microbiome is off, your cat's going to feel off. They're mm -hmm. not going to feel balanced. They're not going to feel good. If you've ever had an upset tummy, like you don't feel good. You feel blah, right? And yeah. so these cats are now on these non-ideal diets and it's going to affect gut health and it's going to make things worse and it's going to create more inflammation. And it's so we're just we're completely missing the point here with these prescription diets and what what the root cause is. We're, we've completely missed it. We've overlooked it. And that's why. The, a lot of times these cats do not improve or get better or you get yeah. limited improvement. That's so true. And I can't tell you how many times clients come to me with a cat who has urinary tract issues, chronic UTIs or whatever, and their vet put them on a dry urinary. It's the worst thing ever. Prescription diet. I'm like, what the heck? That yeah. makes no sense at all. You're just creating a, you're creating a, a, um, yeah, the revolving door to the vet, vet visit. I yep. mean, perpetual vet visits. Yep. It's frustrating <laughs> for everyone. Like you're not helping your cat get better. You're just creating, perpetuating the condition in my opinion. Yep. And I, th you know, and I think that's important to like say too, like for, cause a lot of people will say like the vet's just making money off of you. And here's like, it's no fun to see people that are angry and their pets are not improving. Like it's super, I remember in my earlier days before I sh completely shifted my focus and it's not fun because it, you want them to be better. And two, I, I would say that a lot of vets, unless you own your vet clinic, you're actually not making money off of these prescription diets with the way vets are compensated. Mm -hmm. So I know working in several vet clinics before I started my own business, it was definitely not a money maker for like myself or my salary. And so it's just what you're taught. It's what you believe mm -hmm. is right. And it's like what shoved down your throat through your lunch and learns from the like the pet food companies that come yes. in and tell you how their food's the best and why it's helping animals. And you're just like, Oh, sounds great. That's easy. Right. It's like another tool I can just give them and hopefully it fixes them versus going, wait a second, what went wrong in the body? Is this truly an ideal diet? And you read that ingredient list and you start waking up and it's just, you know, I, hopefully things will start changing because pet parents, like by doing this and learning more, you can ask for better and vets will have to wake up because yeah. they'll lose clients. And yeah. so that's why this is so important. And to have those tools and that knowledge and the education, because you are what will create the change in the industry. Absolutely. And I think you've said this before in a previous talk, when you go take this prescription urinary diet, and you turn it around and you look at the ingredients list, and then you go to the grocery store and you look at the grocery store brands, the same, it's the same ingredients. Yep. I mean, the ingredients are coming from the same like rendering facilities too. A lot of times they're owned by the same companies. Mm -hmm. So this is where a lot of what I forgot the name, I think it's called like product batching, um, the actual name for it, but what companies will do. So you have your umbrella companies, right? You have Mars, you have Colgate, Palmolive. Yep. Yes. The the toothpaste company and the, the the candy making company owning a lot of these right. brands. And so they make the the food at their facility and then they slap different labels on it for the different companies that are underneath uh -huh. that umbrella. And so you're actually, and this is why whenever there's a recall, you'll see like there's quite a few brands that are recalled and you're like, why is that? That's because of that. They're using the same ingredients. It's being made by the same companies, mm -hmm. um, manufactured at the same facilities. They're using the same synthetic vitamin mineral mix. All we have to do is go back to 2007 with the melamine problem. Like so thousands of pets died from kidney failure because of the synthetic vitamin premix that was yeah. brought in from China. 
And mm-hmm. there were pets on prescription diets where they use that premix and it's awful. And this is why getting more and more, once you start learning, you can't undo the learning and you <laughs> start wake, you wake up, right? And it's like, right. how can I better control the source of the ingredients? How can I better do this? And I think too, with the way the world is right now, we have to start preparing for like pet food shortages and things like that. And if you can become empowered to make balanced homemade food with your cats, like there's a lot of great resources out there on how to do that. Start Mm -hmm. doing it now because it will be so much easier for you. You can get vitamin mixes and mix it in and you'll be less likely to be affected if there is a pet food shortage, especially if your cat's on like a a prescription diet, like, my gosh, yeah, we just saved you like hundreds of dollars, like every thing, like every month, like, because now, you know, if you didn't know before, like you can use other foods that aren't the prescription diet. Absolutely. And I was listening to a, a show today that was talking about how the possibility of, of having an aluminum shortage is also yeah. going to be very um, prevalent. And so that affects any industry that uses aluminum. And immediately I thought of pet mm-hmm. food because of cans. Yep. So your your cost for canned food is going to go up. So now would be a great time to switch and start trying some of these other fresher, even freeze dried raw diets, home making your your food using a, a complete balanced mix or just like stuff off of Dr. Lisa Pearson's website, catinfo.org, her recipes. Yeah. And just because I've, I've also heard that it's cheaper to make your own food than it is to buy canned. Cats. And this is something that I'm going to start getting more into just because, I mean, the more you do these talks too, you're like, why am I not doing it? And time and whatever reason you want to give. But once you start getting into it, we used to make food for our 75 pound German shepherd. Making food for like, you know, a 10 pound cat is so much easier and you yeah. can batch, you can batch make it. And you know, have fun with it and see, like you get to infuse love, like the energy and everything into that food, which is so much better than worrying like, oh God, what ingredient is this? Where did they source it? Does it have chemicals? Like it's scary. Like when you start learning about the pet food industry and how unregulated it is and how they're not coming from a place of making pets healthier. And that's a scary part, but you know, there's other great resources too, like the catinfo.org, um, yeah. what cats should eat book by Dr. Jean. Um, her last name is H O F V E. She's that great resource. Um, there's also Dr. Karen Becker's book, uh, real food for healthy pets. There's a lot of great, uh, recipes in there. Um, complete guide to holistic cat care, um, by Dr. Jean also. Those, there's a lot of resources out there for balanced diets. You can also even go to balanceit.org or balanceit.com, sorry, balanceit.com. And you can create your own recipes. You can either use their their vitamin mix or you can use some of the other cat vitamin mixes that are out there. Raw Feeding mm-hmm. Miami, I was just shopping on their site uh, yesterday for the cats and getting some meats and some vitamin mixes to start kind of showing people too, like the different oh, cool. options that are out there. But yeah. just like Raw Feeding Miami, just go there and type in like cat and you'll see a lot of the different options that can get you started. Oh, that's great. So what other prescription diet recipes, products did you bring to us today? Let's see. So, so and one of the things I want people to also think about, like, as I'm saying some of these ingredient lists, it sounds very similar, right? It sounds like I'm mm-hmm. repeating the same thing. Like that's, and yeah. so that's the point of this, like, yeah. you know, and we're saying this is a kidney diet or this is a, like a urinary diet for stress, or this is a, I mean, that the hypoallergenic one was definitely very mm-hmm. limited in anything. Yeah. <laughs> and so, okay. um, but I also looked up because a lot of cats have diabetes. Mm-hmm. And so I looked up what they're using for that. So typically with our cats, if we're feeding their appropriate diet, they're not going to have insulin resistance. But what can happen is, is that um, in terms of we're feeding like a kibble diet, a really high carbohydrate, that's what can that's going to affect the pancreas, the digestion, it's going to increase insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. And so that's what can lead our cats to developing diabetes. And so with that, we should be feeding foods that tend to be higher in fiber, actually, um, for cats to help regulate their blood sugar levels. But also we need to be feeding a higher protein, water, 
species appropriate diet. So I looked up a canned food because once again, I went with like my judgment, like, please at least like recommend a canned food. And the ingredient list for this one is water, chicken liver, chicken, pork liver, pork byproducts, chicken byproducts, powdered cellulose. And then we have modified corn starch, wheat flour, mm -hmm. natural flavors. This one has carrageenan and then it has all of your um, wheat gluten's also further down at the end too. So they added it in a couple times, different types of wheat product. So I'm thinking to myself, why the heck are we adding in, you know, these vegetable proteins, the glutens, the things that we know create inflammation. And it's just, it's one of those things, like, why would we feed this? And it sounds very similar to what's over the counter once again. Exactly. So it's, I mean, I've done in previous like webinars that I've talked about, like pet food is I've actually compared the two and I've shown like, this is a prescription diet ingredient list. And this is an over the counter, something like for like a lower quality one. And they were almost exactly the same. Exactly. Exactly. So, and then you have to, people should be asking, why is this in here to begin with? Wheat gluten? Yeah, wheat it's flour. I mean, we know it's used as a thickener, but in in some cases they use those products as a cheap protein replacement too, because they would don't want to spend the money on real healthy quality pro animal protein. So let's throw some vegetable protein in. There. Yeah, it's like that's one of the things I look for on an ingredient list is mm -hmm. you know why are we using potato protein that. We taught rice protein concentrate was also one of those ingredients and in another one, yes. uh, your corn, wheat, soy. We know that soy increases the risk of hyperthyroidism in our cats. Mm -hmm. How many cats develop hyperthyroidism later on? And that's the problem. I mean, there's also links to the aluminum cans too with canned food, fish yeah. products. So mm -hmm. there are, this is why learning what these ingredients mean, where they're being sourced, it, it changes. It changes everything once you start becoming aware of that. Exactly. Yeah. Did you um, notice anything in particular on any of the like gastrointestinal diets, like cats that have IBD and things like that? <laughs> it's the same ingredients, but I did. The one thing that I was really shocked by is that some of them had carrageenan. Carrageenan. And mm -hmm. it's like, what is happening? Like, it's like keeping them on the food, right? Like they yeah. never improve. So you think they always have to be on this diet. And it just, it, it's crazy to me. Like this, yeah. these companies, they know that carrageenan is a GI irritant. And like, so even going through these, like, why is this in a, the diabetes canned food that I, that I brought up from one of these big companies and it just shouldn't be, it shouldn't be used. This is where there's other alternatives like wear gum or other thickeners that they can use that are going to be less yeah. likely to create inflammation in, in the gut. Exactly. So are just for, um, like brief, other ingredients would that parents really need to look out for? And, and if they see this on a list, it's like, absolutely no. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Yep. So biggest things that I'm looking for, for one, carrageenan is always on there. I'm looking for mm -hmm. what we just talked about using vegetable proteins. So are yeah. you seeing like your, your potato proteins, your corn, wheat, soy, um, rice, you know, cats don't need rice. It's not helping them. I'd also be looking for preservatives. So this is going to be like ethoxyquin, BHA, BHT, BHQ, all of those mm -hmm. things where you see it and you're like, I don't think that's a vitamin or a mineral. Um, look it up and see, like, is it a preservative? Um, yeah. And a lot of these preservatives are banned on the human side because they're known carcinogens. Carcinogens lead to cancer down the road if you're exposed to them enough. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also looking for for one, like GMO ingredients too. So that's going to come back to a lot of like your corn and wheat. Um, and the reason for that is, is we know that those, those products are heavily sprayed um, by herbicides, pesticides. So things like Roundup or glyphosate, and they're, those are really toxic for the body. Um, there's a book by Dr. Stephanie Senna called Toxic Legacy. Mm -hmm. Highly recommend every single person read it. It's like Rachel Carson's Silent Spring years ago. And it's, it's crazy. It's insane. I mean, I, 80% of our rainwater has glyphosate. We're drinking it. Like it's, 
it's not good. And so if we can avoid the foods that are heav heavily sprayed, and a lot of people will also use grain free, here's the problem with that. So those those crops that tend to be grain free, so legumes, so looking for chickpeas and the legume family on the ingredient list, those crops tend to be sprayed at the end of harvest. Mm -hmm. And what it does, it's used as a desiccant. So it dries out the crop and they end up having a higher concentration of those herbicides. So yeah. I try to avoid those as much as possible. Um, the other things too is making sure if you see like a meal, like, so it'll say like chicken meal or beef meal, or sometimes it'll say meat meal. I avoid that because these are rendered products. And so rendered products, I won't go, I, I don't know if we have time to go into rendered products. Look up rendered products yeah. like because, what was that? We have about five more minutes. So yeah. Okay. So rendered products are essentially where all the waste products, all the diseased animals, the things that are not fit for human consumption go into this pit at the rendering facility and they're boiled down into this like sticky, fatty substance and cooked at really high heat temperatures. This is where you see like beef tallow is the fat that's extruded from it. This is the stuff that's sprayed back onto kibble to make it taste like tasty again, because no, no animal will actually eat kibble straight off of the production line. So they spray this fat that can go rancid back on it. And then they take this mixture and it's this high protein, like meat meal. And if it doesn't say what type of meat, it could be anything. It could be the roadkill coyote. It could be the disease down cow. It could be the euthanized animals. They all go somewhere, right? And the rendering is like the recycling. There's other products that are made from rendering facilities too that are important, like glue and like cosmetics and all sorts of other things. Like it's just, that's where things go. The waste products from the grocery store. So you think about like not super high quality, but it gives that the protein, a higher protein amount in the food. So that's why these companies use it. It's very cheap, um, easy mm -hmm. to source. Um, so if you see meal, make sure it's designating chicken meal or poultry meal or poultry byproduct meal because it is a rendered product. So that's a big one that a lot of people don't realize that what that means. The other things I tend to avoid too for cats is making sure that fish is not the main ingredient because the fish that's being used by the pet food industry is not healthy fish. And a lot of times they have heavy metals, other toxins, other chemicals, um, they're farm raised. So they're diseased, they're not healthy. And that's, that's very important. And it's also very addictive to cats. So it can make it really hard to transition them. And I talk a lot about variety with foods. Mm -hmm. um, so making sure that you're not feeding fish all the time, it, it can be very hard to avoid. Um, it's in almost everything. And companies know cats like fish. And so they right. use it because the cat will eat it. Um, so that's another one. Um, I would also say too, another thing I'd be looking at is looking for menadione. And this is a synthetic form of vitamin K. It can also be called vitamin K3. And this has actually been banned from the human industry from being used in su supplements because it, it's another known carcinogen. It's very toxic. Um, I think it also affects liver health too. So if you have a cat that's all of a sudden having elevated liver values, I'm always asking like, what toxins are we dealing with? Is there something else going on that's been going in? So that'd be something I'd be looking at, menadione. Um, it's required in canned foods that contain more than 30% fish. So if you see fish and you see menadione, it could be that the, the amount of fish used in that food is over 30%. Wow. So, so those would be some of the main things I'd be looking for when you're looking at the ingredient list. And Janet says, um, we talked just about, about fish and why it's not a good protein option, but she says, is it just an issue for kidney compromised cats or is it the same with dogs? It's an issue for all cats and especially kidney compromised cats because fish contains the bone also, which is higher in phosphorus. Oh. And so, so kidney disease cats, cats that are prone to urinary tract issues. So your male cats that tend to get blocked, you want to avoid fish at all costs. Um, and it's the same for dogs, same reasons. It's just that it's a poor quality fit. Like I think Dr. Jean in her book talks about it being like trash fish. Um, so, and it's not like we think about fish. I think like wild Alaskan caught salmon, right? And like, it's not that it's farmed. It's pumped full of chemicals, like colorings. It's fed trash too. Like 
There's also tilapia is one of the, like the worst fish out there um, because they'll eat anything. So they feed them like diseased meat. And like, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy when you start learning about what they're doing to, you know, to everything. Like, you know, yeah. there's, there's not a lot of regulation, especially when it comes to pet food. Feed well, great. That, not yes. Great. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And we are going to have to wrap this up, but gosh, thank you so much. This has been so informative. We had some great comments and some input and feedback. Um, so people can find you at the natural pet doctor.com and I will do my best to put a list of those recommended reading sources on this, on our um, show notes for this broadcast so that people can go back and just do some more digging and research because the more, you know, the more you learn, the more you can do better with the choices that we make and we can raise just really happy, healthy kitties and, and dogs. So yes. that's the goal. We want them to live healthier, happier, long lives for sure. So thank you. Yeah. So thanks much. so much for having me. It's been it's always a pleasure. Absolutely. Okay, everyone, we will see you next month. We have another really great presenter next month. So until then, have a great evening and we'll talk to you next month. Bye everyone. Bye.